what we do here is go back, 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 back. The Czech Republic is a stunning destination known for its striking architecture and world-class beer, but there's more to this country which doesn't always get the spotlight. While Prague is the go-to for most travelers, it can feel a bit overcrowded and touristy for some, so that's where Brno comes in. After asking for alternative recommendations, you pointed me to this not-so-hidden gem. From exploring underground labyrinths to literally bathing in beer, I had an unforgettable experience. So in this video I will be sharing everything I discovered about Bruno using footage I captured during my visit earlier this year. Hello, Sia, Salute and Ahoy! I'm Anna, the Transylvanian eHag and Certified Cat Lady here with another random topic that became my monthly autistic hyperfixation, and that is the history and architecture of the most beautiful city in Central Europe, Brno. I'm sure that statement didn't trigger half of Central Europe's population. I know some of you wanted me to make a video about Hungarian folk art instead, but I'm putting the Hungarians in timeout for a while for flooding my comment section with stuff like this. Go stand in the corner. Before we dive into Brno's history, architecture, and other tourist attractions, let's explore some fun facts about the beautiful Česká Republika. The Czech Republic ranks as the 7th safest country in the world. It also boasts the most castles in Europe, which as a Transylvanian I absolutely love. Czech people are the world's biggest consumers of beer? No way, I had no idea. Czechs have also given us some amazing inventions like soft contact lenses and American classical music. Yes, that's a thing. And I can make a video about it if you want. Czechs are also the only European people whose languages we Further than Polish. 333 stříbrných stříkaček stříkalo přes 333 stříbrných střech. And I'm saying this as someone who speaks Hungarian. Hey, te, vajáček je kičit. Vy taká svoděl nít máme skocit. Also, Czechs are the prime godless heathens of Europe. According to 2021 statistics, half of the country are not religious, plus 30% are undeclared, which means that I'm gonna party hard in hell with the Czechs and the Estonians. Even though it's often labeled as a trashy Eastern European country, thanks to being post-communist and Slavic, the truth is the Czech Republic is one of the most stable and prosperous nations in Europe, boasting the lowest unemployment rate in the EU. Good for you, my little Yishis and Bozhinas out there. So, without further ado, let's dissect this topic. Brno is located in the historical region known as Moravia, nestled near the borders of Austria and Slovakia, where people celebrate the resurrection of Christ by spanking a woman for some reason. If only someone made a 30-minute video explaining the meaning of these kinds of traditions. Oh wait, I did. Its history stretches back to the Neolithic age, but it gained prominence in the 11th century with the establishment of the Pilberg Castle. Brno is also a hub of intellectual and technological innovation, it is home to Masaryk University, and a attracts global talent through its numerous scientific centers and high-tech companies including IBM and Red Hat. So let's explore some buildings and uncover the hidden stories they hold about this city's history. By the mid-11th century, Moravia had split into three territories, Brno, Olomouc and Znojmo, each ruled by a prince of the… What letter is that? Ash. How the hell is that Ash? Semislid? Semislid? Přemyslit. Whatever. All three regions were ruled by a prince of that dynasty, but still under the watchful eye of the Bohemian king. Since this name will come up several times in the story, I will have to explain this. The Chemistid dynasty was a significant royal family, considered the first historical rulers of the Czech lands, with Chemistil Otokar I becoming the first king in 1198. The dynasty played a crucial role in the formation of the Czech state and expanded its influence through marriages and territorial conquests. Brno and Olomouc were the political power duo for the region, hosting all the major events until Brno's closer proximity to Vienna in the 17th century gave it the upper hand. Brno scored royal privileges in 1243 thanks to its German-speaking population, which might explain the local love for sandals and beer. By the 14th century, Brno and Olomouc were taking turns as the political heavyweights, hosting regional assemblies and important gatherings. Brno's population suffered a bit during the Hussein 
Hussite Wars. If they don't ring a bell for you, the Hussite Wars were a series of conflicts in the early 15th century in Bohemia, sparked by religious and social reforms advocated by Jan Hus. Following Hus's execution in 1415, his followers, known as the Hussites, fought against Catholic forces in a struggle for both religious freedom and social justice. The wars culminated in the Compact of Basel in 1436, which granted the Hussites some concessions but did not fully resolve the underlying tensions. For a more fun fantasy spin on those events, check out Andrzej Sapkowski's Tower of Fools. The Hussites laid siege to the city twice and both times it was in vain. But enough about the battles, let's dive into the historical architecture of that epic era. Spielberg Castle has been around since the 13th century when Chemiso Ottokar II decided Bruno needed a fortress to protect the Czech lands. Fast forward a few centuries, the place had leveled up into a serious military stronghold. Then in the 18th century, Emperor Joseph II flipped the script and turned it into one of the toughest prisons in Europe, locking off some notorious dudes like Italian poet Silvio Pellico and infamous Czech outlaw Václav Babinski. During both world wars, it doubled down on its prison game, holding political enemies and Czech patriots during the Nazi occupation. Luckily, today it serves a totally different purpose. Now it is a cultural hotspot and museum where you can explore everything from a 15 bell carillon to a lookout tower plus the Baroque Holy Trinity Chapel. The Cathedral of Saints Peter and Paul in Brno, also known as Petrov, is a dominating landmark in the city skyline, which dates back to the 11th century. Its exterior is primarily Gothic from the 14th century, with 84 meter towers added in a Gothic Revival style in the early 20th century which is more than 50 times my high damn. A major fire during the 17th century led to an extensive reconstruction due to the Thirty Years' War. The Thirty Years' War was a conflict primarily within the Holy Roman Empire involving various European powers. Initially, it was a struggle between Protestant and Catholic states, but it expanded into a wider political battle which resulted in massive devastation and loss of life. After diving into all this Christianity lore, I understand why Czechs became such godless heathens. The church has been rebuilt several times with Baroque-style interior renovations by architect Moshe Grimm in the 18th century, but more on him later. A fun fact is that the cathedral's bells famously ring at 11 am instead of noon, commemorating a clever ruse that helped end the Swedish siege of Brno. Basically, during the Thirty Years' War when laying siege to Brno, the invading Swedes promised that they would call off their attack if they had not succeeded in taking the city by midday on the 15th of August. The citizens decided to ring the bells an hour early on this date, fooling the Swedes into breaking up the siege and leaving empty-handed. St. James's Church is a 13th century Gothic gem originally built for German settlers, but long before it became the grand Gothic structure we see today, there was a smaller Romanesque church on the same spot, serving the Flemish and the German locals. Over the years, it went through some major upgrades, and the current design, with its late Gothic flair, took shape in the mid-15th century, borrowing architectural vibes from Prague's St. Vitus Cathedral and Vienna's St. Stephen's Cathedral. Its current tower, finished in the 16th century, stands at 95 meters tall, which is 57 times my height. <laughs> And if you love quirky local legends, here's a good one. A stonecutter supposedly carved a guy mooning St. Peter and St. Paul's Cathedral, bragging about the fact that it has a taller tower than Petrov. The old town hall is a stunning building constructed around 1240, featuring a decorated gothic portrayal of the famous architect Master Anton Pilgrim. Legend has it that Pilgrim wasn't paid for his work, so he intentionally bent the turret. The building has some interesting historic halls, like the Crystal Hall and the 6th Street Perimeter Tower, offering a lookout gallery. Another important legend associated with the building is that of the Bruno dragon. Apparently, a dragon was terrorizing the locals, devouring livestock, until a clever butcher decided to fill an animal hide with caustic lime, disguised it as food and fed it to the dragon, successfully vanquishing the beast, which is a pretty common trope in West Slavic folklore. The thing is, the dragon's actual body was preserved as taxidermy, which today hangs above the town hall's gates. However, if you look at it, you can clearly see that it doesn't resemble a dragon. Oh, you are a crocodile! Historians suggest that this exotic animal was likely a gift from a visiting dignitary and mistakenly thought to be a dragon. The Church of Saint Michael <laughs> 
this one. This church of St. Michael dates back to the 13th century when Margrave Chemiso of Moravia handed the church and its land over to the Dominican order to build a monastery. In case you don't know, Margrave is the hereditary title of some princes of the Holy Roman Empire. And to dive into some Catholic lore too, the Dominican order funded by Dominique de Guzman in France in 1216 is a Catholic medicant order, meaning one of those monks who cosplay as poor and relies on charity for its livelihood in exchange for preaching. They also focused on combating heresy. By the 17th century, the church took a hit from the Swedish army, but don't worry because soon after, architect Jan... Oh boy. Jan Kštitel Erna swooped in with a baroque makeover, turning the church into the stunner you see today. This guy was a builder and master mason and stonemason, active in Moravia and especially in Brno, who contributed to the appearance of several important buildings from that era. And fun fact, Gregor Johann Mendel, yes, the guy who basically invented modern genetics, celebrated his first mass right here. The governor's palace has been around since the mid-14th century, originally tied to the church of St. Thomas, but it didn't always look like the baroque gem it is today. That transformation came later in the 18th century thanks to architect Mojic Grimm. A not so fun fact about him is that a glazed coffin of the mummified body of Grimm is located in the crypt of the Capuchin church in Brno, which is kinda grim. Anyway, fast forward to 1990, the governor palace became part of the Moravian gallery, so now it's not just a pretty building. Inside you got short-term art exhibitions and a popular cafe. The Church of St. Thomas and the Annunciation dates back to the 14th century, and if you're into that upper central European royal drama, you might want to know that both John Henry and his son, Jobst of Moravia, are buried here, along with John Henry's second wife, Margaret of Opawa. Look, it's not like I was never interested in that topic, but reading a 800 pages of Andrzej Sapkowski's yapping about this made me lose my marbles. This church also took some serious damage during the Third Years War, but afterwards the church got a little baroque glow up in the second half of the 17th century, and it looks absolutely stunning with this cool facade. A less funny fact is that there's an ossuary under the church, meaning a depository for the bones of the dead. The number of discovered remains there makes it the second largest ossuary in Europe, right behind the catacombs of Paris. So that's some real dark. Dark Souls 3 shit right there. This place was used for entering the skeletal remains of graves, which were then freed up to bury others. The labyrinth under the vegetable market is quite the hidden gem, literally, consisting of medieval cellars that sits 6 to 8 meters underground. The space offers a glimpse into the medieval past, evoking the atmosphere of games like Dark Souls 3 or Witcher 3. I was constantly expecting something to jump out at me from the darkness so I could pull out my sword and yell, Dead. Damn, you're ugly. Damn, you're ugly. This underground space wasn't just for show, it was used to store food, wine and beer, and even served as a shelter during wartime. The place is really creepy and it's pretty easy to get lost in it forever, so you can only explore it with a guide. They will help you explore the interesting history of the place, where you get to peek into an alchemist's laboratory and check out archaeological finds that highlight Bruno's contributions to science and medicine. The labyrinth is set up to look the way it did during the Middle Ages, it has an old wine cellar and a tavern nodding to the local vine making tradition. If you're into the darker side of history, replicas of a pillory and a cage of fools remind us of the punishments meted out to dishonest craftsmen and merchants in the 17th century. Well, a good thing that isn't a method of punishments for scams anymore, otherwise all the crypto bros and scamfluencers would be down there. The vegetable market itself dates back to the 13th century and it has been a bustling halfway fresh produce for ages and it has a pretty cool vibe. All in all, Bruno has some pretty interesting medieval history carved into the stones of its buildings that date back to the Middle Ages. The early modern era, however, kicked off a new chapter in the city's history and popularized a different architectural style. I just found out that you're not subscribed to my channel. Why? 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 Subscribe. <laughs> You can trace the pivotal moment in Bruno's history back to 1641, when Emperor Ferdinand III decided to move the Diet Court and land tables from Olomouc to Brno. 
why well the threat from swedish armies during the 30 years war made it a strategic move fast forward to 1645 and Brno was the only moravian city that managed to hold its ground against the ikea gang during a siege which really cemented its status as the capital of moravia after the war Brno didn't stop there it retained its capital position officially confirmed by emperor joseph ii in 1782 and later by the moravian constitution in 1849 the house of lords of lipa is a unique Renaissance house built in the 16th century by the Italian architect Antonio Gabri in collaboration with Giorgio Gialdi, which was a famous pasta gobbling duo who worked on several architectural masterpieces in the area. The building served as the residence of the renowned wine trader Christoph Schwanz. Later, it was owned by Jean Louis Hadoui de Souche, a Frenchman who was exiled and became involved with the Swedish army during the Thirty Years' War. And that's the Frenchiest French name I've ever heard. The Aduta Theater is the oldest theater building in Central Europe was mentioned in 1608, although it could be much older. The theater primarily presented German plays with occasional performances in Czech. One fun fact that will make your brain go, wow, that's impressive, is that the iconic Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart performed here. The building underwent several remodels, including a neoclassical glow-up after fires. Although it fell out of use when new theaters were built, it resumed operations following the establishment of Czechoslovakia in 1918. An intrigue the morbid attraction that weirdos like you would probably enjoy exploring is the Capuchin Crypt. Founded in the mid 17th century, it is located in the basement of a Capuchin monastery, which became a burial site primarily for Capuchin friars. Now, I'm not gonna explain who the Capuchins were. If you're curious, go watch my Varajdin video for more Catholicism lore. A creepy fact is that the unique geological conditions and ventilation led to a natural mummification of the bodies buried here, and today those mummies attract tourists and contribute to science scientific research. Also, there is a beautiful fountain on the courtyard of the monastery. The finest fountain is located in the old market area and is made of limestone. The fountain has an antique vibe and features a grotto with Hercules and Cerberus, surrounded by figures representing ancient empires. The composition is topped by Europa, symbolizing the Holy Roman Empire and the victory over evil. The fountain represents water as a source of life and purity, reflecting Bruno's loyalty to the emperor and the city's place in European history. The red crayfish is a house sign which dates back to 1620. This lobster looking red crab or whatever this is, is about one meter tall and it sits above the entrance of the red crayfish pharmacy. A photo from 1898 shows that it was originally part of an older building somewhere else and after renovations in 1907 it was moved to its current place which is a building that houses a private medical facility and one of Bruno's oldest pharmacies. The plague column of also known as the Marian Column, is a Baroque monument built in the 17th century to commemorate a plague epidemic. It is dedicated to the Virgin Mary and five plague saints inspired by a similar column in Vienna. Construction was led by the workshop of Jan something something Erna using white grey marble and limestone for sculptures. The column features an entire gang of statues including Saint Sebastian, Roch, Charles Borromeo, Francis, Javier, Xavier, Xavier, I don't know how to pronounce it, whatever. This whole thing was a collab among several popular sculptors. The Column of the Holy Trinity is a Baroque sculpture built in the 18th century to honor the Holy Trinity and Saint John of Nepomuk. Later it was extended with statues of the city's patron saint, Saint Constantine and Saint Primitive. Ah, they named the saint after my sense of humor. Great. The structure features seated figures of Christ and God crowned by a dove representing the Holy Spirit. At the base is a statue of the Virgin Mary along with angels and the statue of Saint John of Nepomuk at the back. The new town hall used to be the Moravian Diet House. Oh, not that kind of diet. The Moravian Diet was the governing body of Moravia, acting as a type of parliament where important people from the region came together to make decisions. Before it became formal, it started as informal gatherings of influential people who represented the region's interest. Over time, these meetings evolved into an official assembly for making laws and managing the region's affairs. The building features an interesting mixture of Baroque, Gothic and Renaissance elements with notable features including a Gothic cloister, a Renaissance staircase and two limestone balconies with sculpted human figures and eagles. When Bruno's civic authorities outgrew the old town hall in 1939, they decided to repurpose the old Moravian Diet House and extend it. Today, it serves as the main building for 
the city of Buenos Mayor's office and local government housing various municipal departments. A fun fact is that Queen Elizabeth made a speech standing on one of these balconies in 1996 and the not so fun fact is that Hitler did the same a few decades earlier. After the French discovered their favorite hobby, the revolutions, Europe's history took an interesting turn, kicking off the era known as the long 19th century. And as you might expect, fashions in architecture changed yet again. A major 19th century historical event in Brno involves the Battle of Austerlitz, which took place near the city. This massive military conflict included the French, Austrian and Russian empires, leading to one of Napoleon Bonaparte's greatest military victories. Fortunately, the clashes did not directly involve the city, although Napoleon stayed there during the battles. Additional significant events of the era include Gregor Mendel conducting his pioneering genetics experiments in Brno and the introduction of the first tram service. In 1839, the first train arrived from Vienna, marking the start of rail transportation in the Czech Republic. Oh, and I think they became part of the old empire as well. <laughs> Brno's mail railway station is located in the city center, where the former city walls once stood. The first station, built in 1838, was designed as a terminal by Austrian architect Anton Jungling, who could be considered the schnitzel-loving counterpart of Puff Ferenc. Now, if you don't know who Puff is, boy, you got a lot of lore to catch up on. At the turn of the 20th century, some art nouveau elements were added to the design. Wait, freeze frame, zoom in and take a good look at it. The details of these statues are absolutely stunning. Blue Star Townhouse is a stunning Renaissance origin building rebuilt in the 19th century with, with a neo-Renaissance facade. Its underground spaces once served the municipal brewery. Shocking. The facade boasts decorative balconies with floral railings and gilded details. Due to its ornate design, the house is considered an iconic architecture and historical monument because of course every charming city needs a cute blue building. The red brick evangelic church, built in the brick gothic style, was designed by Viennese architect Hein Heinrich 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 Ferste. I can't do this anymore. Switching between pronouncing these Czech and German names is probably harmful for my brain. Now, fun fact, he's also the mastermind behind Vienna's Café Central and Palais Fersto, and another palace whose name I cannot pronounce, and a bunch of other cool buildings that I probably have footage of somewhere on my camera, but I totally forgot about them. The church opened in 1867, four years after construction started, and was one of the first major non-Catholic churches in the area. Its design is inspired by northern German Protestant churches, and features a 50 meter high tower. The interior is quite simple, staying true to the Protestant traditions, and it's popular for its amazing acoustics, so it regularly hosts spiritual music concerts. And we are reaching my favorite part of the video. Mahen Theater was designed by my architecture sweethearts, Fowler and Helmer, in a mixture of neo Renaissance, neo Baroque, and neoclassical styles. It was one of the first public buildings in the world lit entirely by electric light, with plans drawn up by none other than Thomas Edison. The theater was built after the original Reduta Theater burned down in 1870, a common occurrence in Central Europe. My boys were often commissioned to build more durable and less flammable replacements, complete with safety upgrades like extra exits and electric lightning. Wait a minute, what if they were secretly burning down theaters just to get more work? Anyway, the theater opened in 1882 with Beethoven's consecration of the house and plays by Adolf Frankel and Goethe. Originally a German opera house, it was renamed later after Czech writer Jiži Mahen during the Czechoslovak era. And here's a fun fact for the theater kids lurking in the corners. Yep, you, I see you. This theater hosted the premiere of Prokofiev's Romeo and Juliet Ballet, which is pretty cool. Also, this building is now my phone's wallpaper. The name of the large park surrounding the castle is Spielberg Park and this place is awesome. I mean, look at that little pony. Here are several routes to the castle, all involving a steep climb, which is definitely my vibe as a Transylvanian. The park features a lookout gazebo from 1885. The CMB Banks building was constructed in the 1890s and it quickly became one of the 
Brno's most prominent 19th century buildings. It has a palace-like design with a central facade featuring Corinthian columns and rich stucco decor, blending Baroque and naturalistic styles. The building was renovated several times, including in the 90s, with the intention of serving the Czech National Bank. The House of the Four Giants is an interesting neo-Renaissance building on Liberty Square, constructed at the turn of the century. The building is named after four statues of mythical titans or atlases supporting decorative pillars designed by sculptor Johann Eduard Tomola. Since the statues were intended to realistically depict how people might look if they had to carry a huge amount of weight, they have some strange expressions. Now I'm not saying that they are ugly by any means, and I'm not even gonna ridicule them. All I'm saying is that the locals began to refer to them as mamlas, which is a derogatory term in some Central European languages used to describe someone who is a bit slow, if you catch my drift. So yeah, that was Bruno's history up until World War I. Following that, as you might expect, the city experienced a significant and ongoing transformation in its affairs. If you ever opened a history book, you might be aware of the fact that living in Central Europe during the 20th century was not particularly enjoyable. At the turn of the century, Brno's central area had a predominantly German-speaking population, while the suburbs were mostly Czech-speaking. Now, after World War I, when Czechoslovakia declared independence from the Austro-Hungarian Empire, Brno expanded by annexing neighboring towns to increase its population and dilute the city's German-speaking majority. Then, World War II happened. Happened. During the Nazi occupation, Czech universities were closed and many citizens were imprisoned, tortured or even executed. The Jewish population was also deported, with less than 10% returning as survivors after the war. Now, if that wasn't enough, Allied attacks also destroyed much of Bruno's industrial infrastructure and resulted in the deaths of thousands of civilians. But I'm not done yet. After World War II, ethnic Germans were expelled during the Bruno Death March and thousands died during that process. Oh boy. After that, Bruno became part of the Czechoslovak Socialist Republic. That's some dark stuff, so let's look at some pretty buildings. The Grandezza Hotel, I have to do the Italian hands to be able to pronounce this hotel's name. The Grandezza Hotel is located in Bruno's historic center near the old market, and it has a similar vibe to that one hotel in Zagreb, which features a cute park where I usually go to drink coffee and enjoy burek that I buy from the train station. The building was erected in the early 1920s, and since then it has undergone on the detailed reconstruction that preserves its historic charm. The hotel lobby features a hand-painted glass ceiling, adding a unique touch to the experience. Apparently, the rooms offer stunning panoramic views of St. Peter and Paul's Cathedral and Spielberg Castle, but I'm too broke to confirm that. The Tansy Bunker was built during World War II as an air raid shelter. After the war, it was repurposed as a wine store. Central Europeans, man, their only two worries in life are where to get their booze from and how to keep it cold. Shortly after, it was confiscated by the communist government. Wow, surprising. Then the bunker was redesigned to protect 500 key individuals for up to three days, but luckily it was never needed for that purpose. In 2016, the bunker was opened to the public as a tourist attraction, where visitors can explore the shelter's technical areas and exhibits, including prison doors with messages from death row inmates. Of course, we cannot have a city in the post communist side of Europe without a few socialist statues. The statue titled The Victory of the Red Army over Fascism was unveiled to commemorate the 10th anniversary of Bruno's liberation from Nazi occupation. The nearly 5 meter tall statue depicts a Red Army soldier raising his left hand in a symbolic gesture of peace by holding a flag in his right hand. Upon its unveiling, the statue was praised as the best example of socialist realism in the Eastern Bloc and surprisingly, it's not quite as hideous as most socialist sculptures are. Janacek Theater is another opera house because two just aren't enough for a city. This building serves as the largest venue for the National Theater Brno's Opera and Ballet Company. It was constructed and opened in the 1960s and was named after the composer Leos Janacek who created all kinds of cool music like this. Man, I love Czech classical music. That was Bruno's Czechoslovak era history. After the Velvet Revolution, a peaceful protest that occurred in late 1989, the 41 years of communist rule in the country came to an end. Ultimately, in 1992, Czechoslovakia peacefully split into two independent countries, the Czech Republic and Slovakia. Following 
during the split of Czechoslovakia, Brno's workforce transitioned from industry to the services sector. Over time, the city emerged as the IT hub of the Czech Republic, a development that I, as a software engineer, can genuinely respect and appreciate. New industrial zones like Cernovica Terraza in the east were established to accommodate this shift. Additionally, a number of Kirky monuments were erected, adding to the city's unique charm. The astronomical clock is a black stone monument located in the main square on which in 2010. Every day at 11 am, the clock releases a glass marble as a souvenir for spectators, something I had no idea about and I didn't get checked out. This monument commemorates Bruno's 365th anniversary of resisting the Swedish siege during the Thirty Years' War. Now, unsurprisingly, it has received a lot of mockery due to its shape, which resembles something that belongs to your mom. A bronze equestrian statue of Jobst of Moravia was installed on Moravian Square in 2015 as a symbol of courage. I mean, just look at it, I've never seen anything more glorious than this. The design of sculptor Jaroslav Rona faced some criticism as Jobs was known more for diplomacy than courage. Correct. Now, in case you don't know, Jobst of Moravia was a member of the House of Luxembourg, who was the Margrave of Moravia, and he is remembered as an ambitious and versatile ruler who, in the early 15th century, dominated the ongoing struggles within the Luxembourg dynasty and around the German throne. Now, the statue also faced mockery because it stands 8 meters high with unusually long horse legs, allowing it to tower without a pedestal, which looks kind of weird. Now, if any fans of Jobst are offended by this portrayal, they can check out the other depiction of him at the governor's palace. A unique and interesting place to visit is the Museum of Romani Culture, not to be confused with Romanians. Sorry, I have to constantly point this out because some of you still don't know the difference. This museum was founded in 1991 as a non-profit organization and later became operated as a state organization under the Ministry of Culture. It is a unique institution worldwide documenting Romani culture and history through a collection of 28,000 items. These include traditional crafts, dwellings, clothing, fine arts and media documenting Romani life, which is a topic that I really enjoy but I can never find information about it anywhere. The museum plays a key role in promoting Romani tradition, shedding light on an underrepresented segment of history and culture. And honest to the devla, I really enjoyed walking around in this museum. And last but not least, the Bruno Beer Spa is located in the city center and is built in the style of an old underground brick cellar, almost like Dijkstra's bathhouse in The Witcher. But better, because here you can chill in a beer barrel shaped hot Top. The spa offers a unique atmosphere, combining beer baths with various wellness services. Now, beer baths are believed to provide vitamins and minerals that benefit the skin and overall health, which includes deep relaxation, nourishment for joints and muscles, and prevention of back pain. There was like a beer tub literally next to the hot tub, and we could just relax in the water by pouring beer. It was heaven on earth. We also received spa wafers as a gift, although we had no idea what they were at first. So, apparently spa wafers originate from sacramental bread and a chef from a monastery added sugar, milk and spices to create this delicacy. Fast forward a few hundred years and it somehow became a key part of Czech spa culture. So that's it folks, that's all I have for you about Brno today. Although Brno might not be the first city that comes to your mind when planning a trip to the Czech Republic, it has a lot to offer for those willing to explore. I was fortunate to uncover its charm, even if my days were jam-packed that involved hours of wandering the city streets to capture every beautiful building and hidden gem. But despite the hustle, I had an incredible time, especially when I indulged in some halushki and local beer. If you're looking for a vibrant city filled with history, culture, fantastic food and beer, Brno is definitely worth a visit. But enough about my opinions, if you made it this far into this video, you're the real MVP. Here are some treats for you. Comment, thanks for the Tertelnik to confuse the new viewers. If you want to see more content about Central and Eastern Europe, subscribe and check out my other videos. Thanks for tuning in and have a nice day.